grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray, and you gladly give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us your abundant mercy. Forgive us those things that weigh on our conscience and give us those good things that come only through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gloria, 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 Glory to God on high. Please be seated as we hear our readings for today. Today's first reading is from Genesis chapter 18. The Lord said, How great is the cry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Who am I but dust and ashes? Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And the Lord said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again he spoke to the Lord, Suppose forty are found there. The Lord answered, for the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then Abraham said, O oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And the Lord answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. He said, Let me take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And the Lord answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then Abraham said, O oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose ten are found there. And the Lord answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Uh, second reading is from Colossians chapter 2. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, 
according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in Christ, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In Christ also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with Christ in baptism, you were also raised with him, through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made, God made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven, having, having forgiven all us all our trespasses, erasing the record that stood against us with its legal demands. God set this aside, nailing it to the cross. God disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Therefore, do not let anyone condemn you in matters of food and drink or observing festivals, new moons, or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Do not let anyone disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, dwelling on visions, puffed up without cause by a human way of thinking, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows with a growth that is from God. Word of God. Word of life. Be to God. Do you want to come up for children's chat? You want to come up? Come on up for the children's chat, Georgie. We're, we won't quite stand up yet for the gospel acclamation, but if George is willing to come up, and maybe he's not feeling it today, Maeve's going to come up. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. I'm not going to ask you to answer a lot of questions. I think we'll just sing a song here in a little bit. But um, where were one question, George? Where were we two weeks ago? At family camp at Flathead Lutheran Bible Camp in Flathead, Montana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And did you do a lot of singing at family camp? And we've sort of identified again some of your favorite, your favorite songs, right? Should we sing trumpet sounds with these good people? And it's pretty much all a call and response with motions, so we could have some help from people out here, right? Do you think they'll join us in singing? You think so? All right, well stand up. Now you can stand up. Everyone stand up. Help out George and Maeve. And here's how it goes. You're just going to sing back everything I sing. Praise the Lord with trumpet sounds. Praise the Lord with trumpet sounds. Trumpet sounds. Trumpet sounds. Trumpet sounds. Trumpet sounds, trumpet sounds, alleluia, 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 amen. And then it's, what's the next one, George? Do you know the next one? Praise the Lord with flutes and harps. Praise the Lord with flutes and harps. Flutes and harps, flutes and harps. Flutes and harps, flutes and harps, trumpet sounds, trumpet sounds, alleluia, 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 amen. Then this is a new one to me. This one was, this, they've added some, I think, since we got to camp. So this one is, praise the Lord with Scottish bagpipes. Praise the Lord with Scottish bagpipes. Scottish bagpipes. You have to have the accent. Scottish bagpipes. Flutes and harps. Flutes and harps. Trumpet sounds. Trumpet sounds. Alleluia. 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 Amen. 
Okay, this is my favorite, I think. Praise the Lord with a big bass drum. Praise the Lord with a big bass drum. A big, a bass, a drum. A big, a bass, a drum. Scottish bagpipes, Scottish bagpipes, flutes, lutes and harp, flutes and harp, trumpet sounds, trumpet sounds, alleluia, 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 amen. I think Maeve is tired from camping. I don't know. <laughs> all right, one last one. Praise the Lord with all creation. Praise the Lord with all creation. All creation, all creation. A big bass drum, a big bass drum. Scottish bagpipes, Scottish bagpipes. Flutes and harp, flutes and harp. Trumpet sounds, trumpet sounds. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Amen. A little bit of camp, bringing it back. All right. Thanks for coming up, guys. The Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Okay, next time we'll sing Prince of Peace. Gospel according to Luke, the eleventh chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, let your dominion come, give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to that friend at midnight, and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set out. And the friend answers from within, do not bother me, the door has been locked. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though the friends will not get up and provide anything because of the friendship, at least because of the per neighbor's persistence, the friend will get up and provide whatever is needed. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There's one quality of prayer, one word that seems to come up here in our readings for the day. Maybe, as, well, Jesus talks about the word, but maybe especially shown in the Old Testament reading for the day. What quality would you give Abraham when he asks God and negotiates with God in a sort of prayerful way? 
down from 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 30, down all the way down to 10 righteous people. What, What kind of quality is that prayer that Abraham is praying? Oh, I didn't hear that one. Did someone say crazy? <laughs> no. Sort of, sort of in a way. Joella, I think, got the word I was, I was looking for. Persistence, right? Strong is another good word. Any other words? Passionate. And compassionate for the people of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, who we find out in Genesis a little bit later, do terrible things to people. Just terrible things. So, the compassion that he has is amazing. We find out from Abraham and from Jesus that it is not the prayer that is the most theologically correct that is the one that is most helpful to us, although we are very grateful for the Lord's Prayer. We're very grateful for Luther's explanations to the Lord's Prayer that we find in the small catechism. We could do sermon series on all of those things. I think I did that once before. But it's not the prayer that's most theologically correct that is the prayer that Jesus teaches is most helpful. Is it the prayer that's most passionate? Do you ever, you've been learning how to pray like some of our more Pentecostal friends. Oh Lord, Lord, I just really, 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 oh Lord, I really love you and I just really want to see this happen in my life. I don't pray that way very often. Um, And I'm not very good at it when I try to pray really passionately. I think I've talked to you about that before, how I have a funny look in my face when I try to do that. But um, Joel Osteen uh, Yeah, if we try to pray like Joel Osteen and ask for swimming pools with really passionate prayers, we're not going to be, that's not going to be super helpful, I think, in the long run to us. Or is it the prayer that's most mindful of others? The prayer that's most mindful of ourselves? Is it silent prayer or is it a prayer that's like the Lord's Prayer that's been handed down to us over millennia that is the most helpful, I think, It's the most persistent prayer that Jesus is teaching us here. The the one who is the most persistent or even annoying. Sometimes it gets translated as the the friend who knocked on the door that was annoying um, that gets the guy in bed to get up. I'm into another round of spiritual and theological mutual accompaniment with some friends from not where it's, it's a bunch of us from the north in Oregon and, and California and Washington, some various people. We're doing some writing, and we've been doing this for several years with friends that are from Mexico and Peru and Spain and, and Brazil and from the global south. There's more and more of us every year, and we're put in 10 group, or 12 groups of 10 this year. So there's 120 of us now. We started at 8. Now there's 120 people doing this exercise of spiritual and theological mutual accompaniment. And people are sharing a lot in their initial writings. The initial writing is kind of what's going on in your life, and here's a smattering of the things that people are going through. A loving mother watched her son drop out of college in the middle of it. She has no idea uh, what what he's going to be doing. Uh, A Methodist pastor is having a really hard time finding what the vision is for her congregation and what next steps are for her congregation and is really struggling with that and considering leaving her call. And third, there's a Catholic professor who is gay who is, is gone to a new Catholic institution, a university, and is experiencing homophobia in the new institution that he's serving at. These are a lot, a lot of problems that come up and a lot of unanswered prayers whenever we talk about ask and you shall receive, knock and the door will be opened. Persistence is the thing that's most helpful. You can't not mention that there are a lot of unanswered prayers in the world, am I right? Have you ever had a prayer that went unanswered? <laughs> or maybe unanswered in a, uh, answered in a way that you didn't expect? It's a theme that emerges. 
It's a theme that emerges because even though Abraham, here's something ironic, even though Abraham prayed for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, if you could find that ten righteous people in this city, Lord, please do not destroy it. We've remembered this morning that they didn't find even ten. <laughs> there was Lot and his family, there was four. So the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed and, and then they race out of there. Lot's wife looks back and she gets turned into what? So, I mean, my goodness, this is still kind of an unanswered prayer if you think about it. There are a lot of unanswered prayers in our lives, and we have to contend with that and make sense of that. But one theme that emerged from those writings from the folks in STMA and the reason why they would continue walking in STMA year after year or have a faith at all, at like you, you know, what, with your unanswered prayers, why would we continue is just this sense that we're going to keep going. We're going to keep at this. There is treasure to be found. We may not see it right now. George just got really excited about treasure as soon as you mentioned treasure. <laughs> but you have to be persistent to sometimes find what the treasure is. So we live, as Paul says, a life of prayer in being persistent. The Lord's Prayer is really helpful to us in uniting us around words so we have something to say to each other, say with each other every week. So we have something to say on our deathbeds that we remember after all the other memories go, the Lord's Prayer seems to be one of those that stick in there. But it's not necessarily about the words, I don't think. I think when you memorize the Lord's Prayer and you kind of can say it even without thinking, you get to a place beyond the words where it's just about this persistence of prayer, this persistence of faith, this persistence of the faith that helps us through pretty much anything. I am so often like the man who is unwilling to give bread to his friend. When it comes to prayer, do you ever get grumpy about not wanting to pray? Oh, I've got all these things going on. I do not have time. I am too, uh, I, I have uh, all these other things that are distracting me in my life. And what is the good of prayer? All my unanswered prayers, what is the good of it anyway? We can get in a grumpy place. We can get like the friend who is in bed, who there's pounding on the door, and we're staying in bed because I'm not getting up out of bed. I'm not going to do that prayer. I don't want to do that. There are lots of internal challenges that keep us from praying. Then there are the external challenges as well. Like, sometimes I'll go into, um, I'll, I'll do a pastoral care visit, and the TV is on the whole time. And it's really hard for me to, to connect with people if the, if the TV is on, or to pray with people if the TV is on, for other people, that's just the most natural thing in the world to have the TV on. But for me, that would be an external thing that would make it tough for me to pray. I was trying to write this sermon yesterday out on the trail, and I was getting in a really good place. I felt like it was really flowing and grooving, and this huge black fly bit the back of my neck. <laughs> and it's like, oh, goodness gracious, me. And we remember that in the middle of prayer, Luther threw his ink pot at the wall because he thought the, the devil was, uh, was hounding him. So there are lots of internal distractions, external distractions as well, the prayer. I think sometimes we just don't feel like if, if we're not doing those rote prayers every day or those off-the-cuff prayers every day or if we're not doing the wordy prayer stuff, I think some of us feel like we don't do it or that we're not good at it or that there's something lacking where I just want to challenge us that the persistence of prayer is not in the words. The persistence of prayer is in a life of prayer. Think about our farmers. Think about, we were talking about this downstairs, think about how many bad crops you go through to get to one good crop. 
That is a life of persistent prayer, am I right? Whether or not these farmers are literally saying prayers, and I'm sure they are, it is a matter of faith and prayer that farmers hold on to that and have any trust that some, at some point God's going to provide. One way or another, God's going to provide. Or as J.W. shared, he had to get out of farming because it broke his body. And so it was a life of prayer that helped him to understand and to hear and to intuit that that's what he needed to do. So prayer doesn't always look the same for everybody. That's for darn sure. The persistence of prayer is in the specific ways that we are in relationship with God and trust, even in silent ways, in going to the grocery store, in talking with our friends, in helping somebody else out. It could be an action that is the persistence of the prayer in our life. And I hope it is an action. I hope our prayers don't just stay in our bedrooms, but flow out into our lives in the world. Take some comfort in this. Jesus himself was not a monk living in a monastery, right? Jesus himself, I'm sure we, in the Gospel of Luke, it talks about Jesus praying more than any, in any other gospel. I'm guessing that those times where Jesus got away and it said Jesus prayed and then the disciples asked him, Probably right when he started praying. He just got down there and he's, oh, here's a brief moment, Lord, thank you for the day. And his disciples are like, hey, Jesus, how do we pray? How do you do what you're doing? And he's like, I, you didn't even give me 10 seconds to start in on my prayers and you're broken on my life. I'm sure that that was the case, that that was not a wordy, passionate prayer that Jesus was often praying, but just a moment to take a breath and to acknowledge, oh, you know, there's more to life than my life, and there's God, and I'm so thankful. And, and then whoosh, he went back into it, back into the fray. So these prayers, the way that we can be persistent is not always with an hour in the morning. If you do an hour in the morning, I think you're amazing. I hope you keep doing that. But for a lot of us, it's not going to be that. Take some comfort also in this. What is one of the most famous paintings of Christian inspiration and spirituality? Probably 20th century. I forgot to do my research this time. But of somebody knocking on a door. What painting am I thinking about when I, I say that this is a Christian inspirational painting of somebody knocking on the door? Is it, is it a human being? Well, it would be a human being. Who is it, though, that people often have up in their parlors... You've seen it probably from the 50s. There's a man in a white robe, and he's knocking at the door. Who is it? There we go. Favorite Sunday school answer. We know that even as we might put ourselves in the role of the person who's knocking, the friend who's knocking on behalf of the friend, knocking for God to get up and answer our prayers, we remember so often Jesus is the one who is knocking. Jesus is the one who is asking that we get up out of bed. Jesus is the one who asks us to be open to what he would have us, have us do. The key theme is persistence. Keep going so that the stubborn man in bed, which is in all of us, will reluctantly get out of bed and answer the door for the divine to come in and fill us with grace and peace and take away our anxieties and our struggles. Jesus is at the door. Now, if you had to guess, which are the, of, of our kids, George and Maeve, which are the kids' questions that get answered the most at home? Is it the ones that are asked the most nicely? Is it the ones that are asked using the best words? Is it the ones that are most passionate or have your brother or your sister in mind? You know where I'm going with this. The questions that are answered the most at home are the questions that are asked the most persistently. Mommy, 
Mommy, mommy, you've said that before, right, buddy? You want to get our attention. You want to get our attention. And that is what Jesus is teaching us. Be like that child. Be like that child that's persistent in your hope and in your prayer. I want to share this story with you. I think I heard a, a couple of you talking about this earlier, and I'll close with this story. But there is a, a new piece of biblical scholarship that's come out that's really exciting and really kind of mind-blowing. That all happened because of prayer. And it started, this is Diana Butler Bass shared this. She's a, a famous um, Christian writer. She went to the Wild Goose Festival, which is one of these seeker-type Christian, but not Christian, maybe Buddhist, at kind of everything festivals that happen during the summer where people give talks and they connect with one another. And she was the closing sermon for the Wild Goose Festival this year. And one of the people in her life, a friend of hers, is a, a seminarian, an Episcopal seminarian, who's been doing this research, and it all started with her sitting down in a garden in the middle of New York City and her hearing a voice saying, look into Mary Magdalene. And it was very convicting to her in her prayer life. She said, what, Mary Magdalene? I need to look into Mary Magdalene. And so she did. And she went to seminary to study about Mary Magdalene. And it all led to her looking at this really, really ancient old manuscript called Papyrus 66. Papyrus 66 is a third century document that is the oldest known document of the Gospel of John that we have. Of all the manuscripts of the Gospel of John, this is the oldest one. And one of the, one of the texts that gets associated with Mary Magdalene and has been more and more is the story of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And they are of Bethany, but I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. So she goes to the text, and she's looking into this John 11 text, looking to see at the original Greek, the manuscripts written in Greek. And, of course, she loves the idea of Martha and Mary, Martha and Mary, you know, yin and yang, busy, sitting at the feet of Jesus, these different parts of ourselves, but put in two characters. And she looks at the text of the original Greek, and Martha is not in the text. There's Mary, Maria in the Greek. There's, Jesus goes to the hometown of Mary and Lazarus' sister, Mary. It's an awkward sentence. It's an awkward sentence, but the more she spends time with it, she sees it's just Mary throughout the text. The confession that, Mary, that, that Martha is supposed to give in that John 11 text, it's Mary. And so she starts, in persisting in her prayer, persisting in her research, she starts comparing that 3rd century text with a 5th a century text that shows the Gospel of John. And in that text there have been edits made to include Mary and Martha. Somewhere along the way, they had added Martha to the story, whereas originally there was only Mary. And that's very, that was very interesting to that student, and she got together with Diana Butler Bass, who's, who's giving that sermon at the Wild Goose, and they were working through that, because in the Gospels, there are two very, very prominent confessions of Christ as Messiah. There is the confession of Peter, right? You are the Lord, the Messiah. And Jesus says, Peter, on you, you are my rock, and on you I'll build my church. And that is the basis for the Roman Catholic faith, of everything gets built up on Peter. All of the popes are descendants of Peter. Everything gets built up through the line of Peter because of that confession 
There is one other confession that got attributed to Martha, who's a minor character. She just shows up once in each gospel. And she says, you are the Messiah, and goes quietly away. Now, what if, what if Mary should be more prominent? Mary Magdalene should be more prominent. What if, because, because who is the one who, in the Gospel of John, is there, the first person at the resurrection? Mary, right? And she doesn't recognize Jesus. She says, sir, if you've taken my master, you know, tell me where you've gone and laid him. And, and Jesus says her ma name, Mary. And she says, teacher. And, oh, there's a scene that's amazing of her being the first one to experience the risen Christ in a bodily form. And the Marys are there in the synoptics, the first preachers of the gospel. What if, what if we should think about Mary Magdalene as just as an important character as Peter is, as just an, imp as an important disciple, as just as an important model for our faith as Peter? It blows open the whole way that the Roman Catholic Church has done things for a long time long time. And one other piece that came out of this was there was confusion then about, well, it's Mary Magdalene. She's from Magdala. She's not from Bethany, so it couldn't, this couldn't be Mary Magdalene. But they did their research too on that, and Magdala was actually not a town during the time of Mary and Jesus. There was not a town named Magdala. There was a town named after her afterwards, but it was more likely, actually, that Mary Magdalene, that doing their research, was from Bethany. And they found out that the word Magdalene comes from an Aramaic word that I'm forgetting, which means tower. Mary the Tower. It's a title, just like Jesus Christ is a title, just like Peter the Rock is a title. For early the point is, for early Christian communities, Mary Magdalene was seen as a balancing force, the female version of the balancing force. You got Peter the Rock. Okay, good on you, Peter. You've got Mary the Tower. And somewhere along the line, maybe some editors didn't like that Mary was getting prominence, and they added Martha to try to divide and conquer and take away a little bit from Mary, the confession, to take away a little bit how Mary could play a role, an inspirational role for our Christian communities. And all because of a little bit of persistence, a prayer heard, follow Mary Magdala, persistence in research, persistence in theology, persistence. We have one of the most important new pieces of scholarship, Diana Butler Bass was saying, of New Testament scholarship of the last hundred years because this one student heard a prayer and sat down and read the original Greek that no one had bothered to read and seen the difference for all of those years. Martha's not even in there in that original papyrus. So the invitation, friends, is what are the ways in which you are persistent in your prayer? And before you tell me you're not, I'm telling you you are, and I'm asking you, how do you already do it? Thanks be to God. Amen.
let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in God's extraordinary love, let us come near to the Holy One in prayer. Rooted and built up in Christ, we pray for the church, embolden church leaders to take risks for the sake of the gospel, and equip the baptized to proclaim your extravagant love to the whole world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Rejoicing in the works of your hands, we pray for the natural world. Make rivers and lakes, oceans and all waterways, sparkle with your radiance. Protect water sources like the Columbia River and strengthen those who defend them. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Interceding on behalf of the vulnerable, we pray for the peoples of the world. Inspire all rulers and governing authorities to with your justice. Guide the work of our legislators and public officials that they may advocate for the well-being of those who serve. They serve. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Persistent in prayer, we pray for our neighbors in need. To all who have hunger, give daily bread. To all who have bread, give hunger for justice. Open the cries of those who suffer. We especially pray for Jordan, Jordan Jay, Jay, Norma, Norma Evelyn, Evelyn, David, David Mark, Mark Louise, Sharon, Addison, Addison Ashley, Ashley Rose, Gloria, Gloria Lindsay, Lindsay, Paul, Donnie, Ken, Constance and Glenn, Brian, Brian Jerry, Jean, Candy, Chris, Brittany, Butch, Loyetta Jean, Ron, Jimmy, Kim, Mark, Lizetta, Amy, Anna Marie, Lori, Paul, the McLaughlin family, Barry, Sharon, Janelle, Johnny, Randy, Leanne, Leanne Rebecca, Rebecca, Sandy, Sandy John, John, and Marcella. We also pray for our deployed military and for those who have lost loved ones recently. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Abounding in thanksgiving, we pray for this congregation. Bless the prayer and fellowship of ministries in this place. Call us together in times of praise and blessing, trouble and sorrow, in your holy name, merciful God. Receive our prayer. Buried with Christ in baptism and raised with new life, we give thanks for your saints who rest in your eternal presence. Join our voices with theirs as we sing of your great glory. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Receive the prayers of your children, merciful God, and hold us forever in your steadfast love through Jesus Christ, our holy wisdom. Amen. Please be seated.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Merciful God, we confess yes, that, that we have, we have not fo followed, followed your path, path but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and joy, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day and every day overcomes death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens up to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord God, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Holy, 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 holy Lord God, God of might and power, holy is the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna here on earth, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and gave thanks and gave it for all who were there to eat. And he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Eat this, all of you, in remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and poured out the wine for them to drink. And he said, drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this, all of you now, in remembrance of me. And remember, you are forgiven. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. <laughs> Our Father Lord, in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will, will be done, done on earth, earth as in heaven. heaven. Give us, Give us today, today our daily bread. bread. Forgive, forgive us our sins, sins as, as we forgive those who sin against us. us. Save us from, from the time of trial, trial and deliver us from, from evil. For the, for the kingdom, kingdom the power, and the, power, and the, the glory, glory are yours, yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll start with this side of the congregation today, and then go from the front to the back, put your empties in the side tray, and then go over to this side. All are welcome at the Lord's table.
stand. Receive the post-communion blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks to my wife for filling in last minute and sight reading and even singing for us. Oh my gosh. That was beautiful. I sort of teared up. I mean, <laughs> I did. Okay, receive, receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make God's face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Love your neighbor. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.